One thing I'd like to start with is a note of optimism. Um, I think for many people working in the arts and cultural sectors at the moment, optimism is fairly scarce. We've living through a period of recession, of course, living through a period of cutbacks in terms of uh, public money going to the arts and cultural organizations. Um, but the reason for optimism, in my view, uh, particularly in relation to this title is that it's my belief that if we can actually do this well, measure the performance of cultural organizations well, then we may be able to provide a stronger case, a stronger rationale and so on for continued funding support and particularly to provide evidence for those people who are a little bit hostile to cultural organizations, the money they get, and so on. So it was in that light that I think we might try and start off with some degree of optimism. Now, my research was funded by the Arts Council of England through one of its regional art associations, Southern Arts. When the research started, the brief of the research was to try and encourage cultural organizations to use management information better. All right, to actually improve the use of management information, to improve the quality, the clarity of evidence in terms of how the organizations are actually run. Now, one of the things here, of course, is uh, it's a very common aspect of um, academic inquiry. You start with one question, and that leads to a bigger question, and then that leads to an even bigger question. And it's very much the case here that we start off with this small question about how do we measure the performance of cultural organizations. That then leads to a much bigger question, which is, well, to do that, we need some ideas of what these cultural organizations are actually for, right? We may need a, a stronger sense of the ways in which these organizations might operate strategically. And beyond that, there's an even bigger question, which is, well, what are the arts for? And that's the biggest question of all, really, isn't it, for probably people in this room. Now, I do have an answer, right? I have got an answer. Um, and thankfully, it is from an artist, a poet, uh, Byron. Yeah? Okay. Now, I'm not sure how well this is going to translate into Catalan, this bit of 18th century poetry, right? But I think it's a terrific bit of poetry. I wonder whether the translator is able to do it justice. She said she would be able to, right? Oh, she's putting her thumbs up, so she's, she says she is. All right. It is to create and in creator live a being more intense. Now, that's the key line there, isn't it? to live a being more intense, to have a fuller, richer, better life. Now, we can't really do much better than that, can we, in terms of having a rationale for what the arts are for. But how that tumbles forward into the management of arts organizations has become part of the, the challenge, if you like, in terms of um, actually pursuing this question. Okay? Now, one of the interesting features, for me, of this quotation is that it expresses something I've encountered quite a lot when talking to managers of arts organizations who, who make the point that they don't need to justify themselves in any other way than what they are, right? Cultural managers that I meet, very passionate, very committed, believe wholeheartedly in what they're doing of course they do. They don't need the kind of extrinsic justifications. But over the last 15 to 20 years, people working in the arts, people working in cultural organizations, and certainly in Britain, have had to get used to this. They've had to get used to this extrinsic way 
of having to justify what they're doing. So much so that um, <coughs> in a recent series of lectures, um, a very famous artist in Britain, Grayson Perry, that's him on the left, um, he won the Turner Prize several years ago, and he's more recently become a documentary maker, filmmaker, and he, he did a series of lectures recently, last year, major lectures. <coughs> and he made a very interesting point in this lecture, where he effectively turned this big question around, right? He's, and just in case you don't know Grayson Perry, he is famous as a cross-dresser as well, just in case you're wondering why, why he stood there in a dress. Um, he, 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 he turned this big question around. Rather than asking the question, what are the arts for? He said, well, what do you want the arts to do? Right? The argument here is one that I've got used to over the last 15 years or so, which is that the art sector, the cultural sector, has become more and more adept at actually trying to make a case for itself when it's being challenged. There is um, what you might call a tremendous plasticity in the arts, a flexibility. If you look at the academic lens of sociology, for example, arts organizations can claim they make a sociological contribution in terms of encouraging social cohesion and diversity. If you take a psychological lens, you can make the claim that all sorts of arts activities uh, help to enhance people's identities. You can even, uh, uh, from an economist's point of view, and this is some research that I did, say that the arts are tremendously worthwhile. They create wealth, they create employment, they create tourist activity. Even economists have accepted the case now that the arts can be justified in in those terms. There's even a more straightforwardly political set of arguments. Arts organizations can um, enhance regional prestige, national prestige, and so on. So for all of these kind of reasons, we've encountered this kind of system, if you like, that if we're going to look at performance measurement in the arts, then we have a whole series of a whole series of rationales behind them. Now my contention is that it's possible to both identify those rationales and to present sets of performance indicators to actually, uh, if you like, um, provide evidence that those rationales are being undertaken. All right? And that evidence is both internal to the organization, it can improve the management of the organization, but it can also provide evidence for people external to the organization. It can provide data, proof, and so on, that the organizations are being well run. Okay? Now, what this leads to, <coughs> um, I feel obliged to give you a definition, right? I said I'd wait for the translator to... Uh, Maybe sort of read out the definition a little bit. <coughs> yeah, oh, got a thumbs up perhaps? Oh, we have a thumbs up, yes. All right, now if we look at this definition, <coughs> there's some very important aspects of it I'd like, to I'd like to pick out. First of all, there is that line strategic, right? And this strategic aspect is something that my research was very, very important about. All right? uh, sorry, it, it involved this notion of strategy. I encountered a lot very passionate people working in the art sector, working in the cultural sector. And I was asking them questions like, what is your organization for? What are the objectives of your organization? And quite often, what they then did was to describe what they do. Nothing wrong with that, of course. Because it wasn't really part of their approach to be strategic. So I was interviewing a lot of people working in art centers, theaters, galleries, and so on, quite a number of whom didn't really have this strategic approach. And you could say, well, why should they? They were passionately committed to what they're doing. 
They made things happen, right? They were pulling on all sorts of fantastic activities. Why, why should they need to have this kind of strategic thing going on? Well, part of the answer to that came back to my starting point in this research, which is that the organization I was funded by, Southern Arts, was actually giving money, public money, to these organizations. And so, there was an obligation, really, to be able to prove that the money was being spent well. Okay? Yeah. Now, another aspect of this particular quotation is about assessing effectiveness. Excuse me. Assessing effectiveness across all sorts of performance dimensions. And you might notice here that I've put financial and non-financial, right? Because in the early 1990s, there was a major movement in business schools in the United States in particular, coming out of Harvard University, to do with what's called balanced scorecard systems. Now, those of you who studied management probably come across these systems. Started off in the commercial sector, but then began to migrate into the voluntary sector. All right? Even commercial organizations clearly have a whole range of purposes for existing, not just bottom line profit and so on. Yeah? And lastly, of course, for this uh, particular definition, it's one at the bottom here, about advocacy. All right? Now, I'm not sure how advocacy translates very well, but this is really to do with um, the politics of persuasion. Right? It's really to do with being able to provide evidence that you're doing things well. And that's a really important thing to be able to try and do, of course, particularly if you're faced with organizations or even politicians who are not particularly in favor of what you're doing. All right? So there's the definition. Now, I'll better move on a little bit quickly. Right? I'm going to look at a series of, of trends. All right? So. In the early part of my research, or the research projects I was involved with, um, we saw this move to do with balanced scorecards. Now these are a kind of elaborated form of accounting, really. All right? So it starts off with an accounting approach. Performance measurement builds upon the basics of accounting and so on. All right? But also, during the, uh, the late 1990s, we also saw a movement in management studies, in business schools, towards what became known stakeholder theory. Now, a lot of arts organizations are very complex, of course. They're very complex organizations. Certainly a lot of the ones in Britain that I encountered. And one of the major reasons for this complexity is that they have a lot of people pulling their strings. Some of them are getting money from the local authority, local government. Some are getting money from regional government. Increasingly, uh, from the 1995 onwards, organizations were getting money through the National Lottery in Great Britain. Right? So it wasn't just up to the managers, of course, to decide what their organization is for. Their strings were being pulled by all sorts of you know, puppet masters, if you like, funders. So, very complex organizations. Also, particularly in the 1990s into this century, there's a strong movement in public services to adopt a more client-centered, more customer-oriented approach, based in part upon the emergence of different types of ways of thinking about marketing. Of course, public services by character are not necessarily dominated by market ideology. Some of the services are taken out of the market system. So the whole business of satisfaction is no longer measured by price or even use. But the, 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 the movement here was to do more research into satisfaction about public services. All right? And I've also added in an extra element here. Uh, an extra element which is about the ways in which cultural experience is becoming more diffuse. We experience culture in all sorts of places nowadays. We experience it in the home increasingly. We can experience it in all sorts of cultural venues. 
in Britain, culture can be found in all sorts of places. Old churches, faith centers, barns, wharfs, all sorts of things, pubs. You don't just have to go to specific places to experience your culture. All right? Ooh, slides are over here. Now, what this led to is um, something that's very uh, central, really, to my research. Now, there's a, a contention behind this. Right? Having looked at a great number of policy documents, having looked at a great deal of, having interviewed a great deal of people who work in the arts and cultural sectors, I tried to put to, together this idea that it may be possible to render down the purposes of arts organizations into a matrix like this. Okay, so each one of these is a, a purpose, if you like, an objective, a potential objective. So for some arts organizations, innovation is what they're about. It's core to their identity and purpose. For some of the organizations in my research, social cohesion is core to their identity and purpose, especially community arts organizations. They weren't really, you know, pursuing innovation in a big way. They were pursuing social cohesion, and very importantly, it was a specific aspect of, of education, right? A lot of the people that I interviewed put forward the view that cultural capital is not evenly distributed. Some social groups have it much more than others. So one of the key reasons put forward by a lot of people in the cultural sector when I was doing this research was to do with trying to even out these differences, to provide social, cultural, artistic capital to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to get it, right? And, you know, I was talking to the head of the, the library system earlier today. Now, right now in Britain, the library system is under threat. A lot of local libraries are closing down. It's a dreadful situation in Britain for local libraries. Because the purposes of those local libraries in providing social cohesion, providing opportunities for education and so on, has been vital to local communities for a long, long time, since the 1840s in Britain. But they're, they're being closed down right now. It's really quite awful, right? Now, sorry, I'll, I'll go back to the matrix. Um, there's also, on this side, the whole business of trying to make as much money as possible, trying to do it as cheaply as possible, trying to get as many people to go along and attend as possible. Now, those are not necessarily explicit. People didn't necessarily say those things. They're almost unwritten policy objectives. Yeah? Now, access, of course, isn't the same as attendance. Certainly in the arts sector, cultural sector of Britain, access is to do with trying to get different sorts of social groups in to experience the arts who otherwise wouldn't. There's been almost a kind of a welfare ideology behind this, right? So, as you can hopefully see from this, there's my, my contention, really, that any one organization, any one cultural organization, might be able to locate itself within those sets of objectives, all right? And then perhaps, as we'll see later on, I'll see if how long I've got, yeah, as we'll see later on, it may be possible to actually measure the success and the achievement of those objectives, okay? Yeah. Now that's internal management. There's also a second policy matrix for me, which is to do with external funders, external stakeholders. As I was saying before, uh, in Britain, national government, regional government, very interested in prestige. 
So one of the reasons to support the major cultural organisations in Britain is to do with national prestige, as well as, of course, its impact on tourism, which is also a good thing for them anyway. Yeah. So I'll move on. <coughs> The research that I was involved with kind of went beyond um, the specification of objectives. That was an important part of the process. But it was also to do with trying to develop a set of uh, uh, measures that would be appropriate and sensitive and would actually help aid managers in terms of managing their organization appropriately. Now, in which case, you might want to think about what, to, what sort of time scale you're operating with. You could measure the achievement of objectives over time. You might want to set targets and then measure achievement against those targets. Or using the language that emerged relatively recently, you might want to try and benchmark your organization against similar organizations who are trying to do the same thing. Now, this benchmarking process is pretty tricky for a lot of arts organizations because they tend to be quite special. They tend to be quite unusual. You know, benchmarking might work at schools, might work at universities, and so on. They may be trying to do the same sort of things, maybe less so for cultural organizations. But these opportunities for comparison are there. All right? And very importantly, try to set up um, a set of criteria, if you like, for what's actually being measured. And I put forward um, this set of terms. These weren't, these weren't mine. These were emerging in public management during the 1990s, and they continue to be important in um, the management of public services in Britain. It was called the three E's, efficiency, economy, effectiveness. Economy was doing things as cheaply as you can. Efficiency is doing things as well as you can in terms of inputs and outputs. Effectiveness was um, how well you're doing something in relation to your objectives. But during the course of my research, I wanted to add another E. And this is the E for equity, right? Equity became very, very important during the course of my research, right? Equity has a, particularly, uh, a particular strong significance, I think, for all sorts of things going on in the arts and cultural sector. And we have to kind of look at some of the <coughs> contributions of cultural economics when it comes to this. Equity can be broken down into three parts. Into social equity. That means kind of trying to get rid of the social divisions, if you like, in terms of the experience of culture. Into regional equity is an interesting one, which is to do with the distribution of opportunities geographically. In Britain, there is no cultural planning framework. There is no national cultural planning. In Britain, we have it for sports fields. We have it for parks. We have it for recreational areas, I should say. Right? Councils are obliged to provide a certain number of opportunities for people to engage in sporting activities, depending on the number of people who live in an area. No such system exists for culture. Right? And again, I was talking just, just, before, uh, just earlier today about the, the library system here, that libraries have to be provided in terms of numbers of thousands of people and so on. Not the case in Britain, which is why local authorities can close them down. And there's this one. This is probably uh, one of the most interesting ones in a way, but also one of the most uh, difficult. This is to do with sustainability of culture. Intergenerational equity. I don't know how well that translates. Um, but think of it in terms of cultural sustainability. 
The argument here is that one of the key reasons for uh, supporting or having cultural organizations is to keep the culture alive for future generations. Right? So any measurement system you know, has problems trying to, to manage that. It's, it's almost like a leap of faith into the future. Yeah? Imagine a situation in which um, important parts of Catalan cultural identity were just taken away. And they weren't available for your, for, for your future generations. So there's a really vital part of what orca, art, art, art and or cultural organizations do is to keep culture alive for the future. Now, that of course is very, very difficult to measure. You're going to be around in 20 years' time to measure it? Maybe not. So to some extent, there's a leap of faith involved. There's a, a political argument to be made here. All right? And there's a kind of commitment that is required if we're going to try and manage that. Now, I'll just check, see how long I've got. I've got five, ten minutes? Yeah? Five, ten minutes? To, is that reasonable? Yeah, okay. I shall crack on. A <coughs> couple more things. Um, you won't know this guy, right? Yeah. This is a gentleman called Lord Kelvin. <coughs> um, or he became Lord Kelvin. Mathematician. He made the argument. His way of thinking is what you might call positivist, empiricist, scientific. Right? To believe in something, you have to have hard evidence. You have to have a kind of hypothetical framework. You have to have something you can prove or disprove. And usually you prove or disprove it using experiments based on hypotheses and so on. It's a positivist, empiricist, objective approach to knowledge. My view is that we cannot rely on that type of process when it comes to understanding, assessing, and evaluating cultural organizations. You cannot render all of this stuff down to numbers. And if you are doing that, it's actually quite philistine. Yeah? When my research started, um, the premise of the research was to identify numbers, ratios. Yeah? That was supposed to be the powerful basis on which you assess organizations. But, thankfully, I've reached the point where I don't agree. You know, we need different sorts of evidence. Yes? Um, well, fundamentally, we need qualitative evidence as well. Okay? We need to talk to people. We need to have well-trained assessors who can provide qualitative accounts of the success of cultural organizations. Okay? Rather than just relying on the numbers. And I would go <coughs> a little bit further. Um, I would like to suggest that for a successful performance measurement system, we might want those assessors to address a series of key questions. Is excellence thriving? Right? Now you can't judge that on the basis of numbers alone. You need a different set of ways of accounting for it. Very importantly, is the organization sustainable, resilient, and so on? Going back to Grace and Perry, he argued that a lot of arts organizations are resilient. They can respond to all sorts of challenges full of, well, creative people, both in terms of management and in terms of what they actually do. Now, very importantly, audiences, users, are they inspired by their experiences? And we can have evidence for this. Now, increasingly, of course, we're living in a digital age where it's much quicker, perhaps even easier, to provide evidence of audience responses. Perhaps very important. That wasn't around when I started doing my research. And also, 
crucially, with the use of performance measurement systems, we might actually be able to look at the quality of the leadership and the management of those organizations. Yeah. Hidden behind these questions, I think, is something else that's very important, which is about young people, right? Um, I think it's very important to try and ensure that young people are engaged with cultural activity and cultural organizations. We can't leave that challenge alone. Um, I'm very concerned, really, that you know, a lot of the cultural organizations that we have in, in Britain tend to cater for a particular class of people, a particular age of people, sometimes particular ethnicities. But we can't leave young people behind. All right? Now, one last side, um, just to finish off with, and this is to do with my point about optimism. Reasons for optimism. <coughs> one, two, three. Performance measurement system can lead to clarity of policy objectives. It can lead to an increased visibility of um, the expenditure given by public bodies, right? The visibility of what the impact of funding actually is, if you're getting any, right? And it might help managers to actually begin to make good decisions about the allocation of resources in relation to the objectives that they've set out for their organization. So if the measurement of performance is done well, I would like to suggest that that might actually be causes for optimism. Okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hi, Ian. Uh, dir que és un plaer tenir el professor Ian Gillespie aquí perquè hem treballat amb sistemes d'indicadors i els textos seus han, ens han estat, diguéssim, una llum important per aplicar algunes coses en el context en el que ens trobem actualment a casa nostra. Uh, simplement, jo tinc una consideració i una remarca o una pregunta. Una consideració és, en molts casos ens hem trobat en què quan planteges un sistema d'indicadors en una organització, plantejar un indicador li serveix a l'organització per definir un objectiu. O sigui, el procés clàssic és missió, visió, objectius i després els indicadors. Quan et trobes organitzant una xarxa d'indicadors o una estructura d'indicadors, et trobes que molt sovint les organitzacions reconeixen que poden formular un objectiu que fins aleshores no se l'havien plantejat en aquells termes. Amb la qual cosa hi ha una virtut dels sistemes d'indicadors que és, diguéssim, aterrar a terra amb uns indicadors respecte als grans indicadors de fomentar la participació. I els indicadors ens serveixen o serveixen a les organitzacions precisament per concretar, diguéssim, alguns dels objectius en termes quantitatius per poder reportar. La segona qüestió que li volia indicar és en els nostres exercicis que hem fet, hem substituït la seva proposta de les quatre E's i hem substituït la E d'economia per la E d'excel·lència. Perquè ens sembla que economia és alguna cosa que pot ser clarament posada amb eficàcia i amb eficiència i redistribuïda en aquestes dues grans àrees. En canvi, excel·lència és una gran preocupació perquè sempre que vas, diguéssim, amb la motxila dels indicadors de les estadístiques i dels números a les organitzacions, venen les organitzacions i sempre hi ha algú que diu home, però com es mesura el bo del que fem? Aleshores, ja sabem per la bibliografia que el bo del que fem només ho poden, diguéssim, opinar els parts que també saben de qualitat. Amb la qual cosa, diguéssim, el que nosaltres proposem és introduir algunes eines des de l'òptica del màrqueting en termes dels nivells de satisfacció, el nivell de queixes i altres indicadors que serveixen per introduir el tema d'excel·lència, perquè si no, els gestors culturals es troben coixos 
al davant del sector creatiu o del sector artístic respecte a com fem la mesura de la qualitat artística, que és un dels grans temes que no està molt ben... És un repte encara. First of all, I would just like to make a comment about um, your remark, which is an intriguing one, because a, a little anecdote, a little story, which is that during my research, um, I went to one arts organization. It had two managers. I started to talk to these two managers, asking them questions about objectives and so on. And guess what? They disagreed with each other. And they even broke out in a bit of an argument. <laughs> right? Quite a fierce argument. Um, and it was slightly uncomfortable for me to listen to this argument because they were saying things like, you can't possibly believe that. <laughs> now, these are two people who literally work day in, day out across the desk from each other. But they'd never really thought about this notion of what they're trying to do with their organization, yeah? Because they're just passionately committed to what they did, you know, the actual description of the activities. So trying to highlight objectives uh, can actually divide people, but hopefully it could lead to, to clarity as well. I would make a, for, for your question, it's a very good one. I would make a, a technical point, if you like, which is, for me, excellence is one of the objectives, but those E's, they're criteria of the indicators. Yeah. And I think excellence is a very difficult one because um, Grayson Perry, the man I mentioned earlier on, had a good line in one of his lectures. He said, democracy has bad taste. You know, popularity and value may not be the same thing. So if you're looking at excellence, there's all sorts of ways of looking at excellence. Is it historical significance over time? Is it popularity? Is it value? Or are there other ways of thinking about excellence? Maybe the important thing is actually to decide what you think excellence is going to be. Because clearly, if you're an organization that's involved with innovation, you may not be popular. You might not get people nodding in agreement with what's going on. You know, we've all been probably to galleries and so on and been thoroughly challenged by what we're seeing. I wouldn't say we necessarily enjoy it, but of course the significance of what we're seeing may be excellent over time and so on. So it's a technical answer really, but hopefully that addresses what you're saying in some way. Sí, a mi m'interessaria que s'extengués una mica més amb les qüestions relatives a la diversitat cultural i la diversitat expressiva. Fa una estona vostè ha dit que massa vegades els equipaments estan treballant en una sola ètnia, en uns sols mateixos trams d'edat i, per tant, la possibilitat d'obrir-se a col·lectius diferents. Penso que es pot fer tant en els programes públics, en els programes educatius, però també en els continguts, en el que s'explica i en el, que, en el que es presenta. És possible fer una avaluació qualitativa de la diversitat expressiva en els continguts, en el que s'expressa, en el que es diu? I és possible fer una anàlisi dels continguts per veure fins a quin punt afavoreixen una, una visió determinada de l'estat de les coses? Um, one of the major things that I encountered during my research, uh, particularly with art centers, was the extent to which they were performing all sorts of functions which to some extent were related to arts and culture, but also, as you say, were more like community centers. So there was actually a terrific variety in the programs of what these organizations were actually doing. They would even have um, sessions taking place to do with welfare advice or knitting circles. They were called Knit and Nat in Britain. They have all sorts of things taking place to support community activities. But crucially, 
when I was doing this work, multiculturalism, as it was then called, was very, very important. Because part of the work to do with diversity and multiculturalism was to try and tackle some of the problems of racism and divided communities. So for a lot of the people that I in, uh, interviewed, that was absolutely central to what their organizations were about, right? Now, if you take the premise that you can locate your organization within that matrix and you set out your kind of um, mission statement or vision statement or something to include that, then maybe one way to follow that through is to look at the extent to which you're actually programming multicultural activity, yeah? So for some organizations, it's much easier and probably more profitable to put on certain types of things, yeah? Much more of a challenge to try and introduce all sorts of diverse cultural activities. En primer lloc, moltes gràcies per, per aquesta xerrada inaugural. Eh, jo estic bastant d'acord amb tot el que ha dit, però em centraré en el que són les, les infraestructures culturals, que, que és el que hi ha. En aquest país, a Catalunya, tenim la sort de que durant una època hi va haver una bonança econòmica extraordinària i qualsevol població, per petita que fos, creia que era necessari disposar d'una gran biblioteca, d'un gran teatre, auditori, centre de reunions o convencions o sala d'exposicions. Es van invertir molts diners en aquestes infraestructures i malauradament després no van comptar que es necessitaven uns altres diners no només per mantenir-los, sinó perquè aquelles infraestructures poguessin funcionar i poguessin complir la funció amb la que es van pensar. És a dir, hi ha animalades, com per exemple poblacions de 2.000 habitants i tenen una sala per 800 persones. Que dius que aniran tots o només n'hi haurà 200 en el poble vigilant que no passi res? Hi ha coses d'aquestes. Com es podria fer? Perquè també un altre dels problemes que jo hi veig és que les polítiques culturals, si se'n pot dir així, que funcionen arreu, estan eh, pensades només pel temps que durarà el mandat, aquella legislatura. No hi ha una visió de futur més enllà, no hi ha una inversió, no econòmica només, sinó en objectiu cultural, de, de quina manera reinvertirà. I estic d'acord en que aquesta és una cosa que no es pot mesurar. Els diners, les entrades, l'assistència de la gent, si la pots mesurar, la pots comptar, però no pots comptar de quina manera beneficia tot el que ofereixes en art, escultura, pintura, eh, dansa, teatre, cinema, fins i tot qualsevol manifestació artística. I crec que un problema que tenim tots els que ens dediquem a la cultura seria reivindicar que la cultura no és només anar al teatre o és només anar a un concert i poder accedir a un preu més o menys assequible, sinó poder donar diverses possibilitats, i aquí estic d'acord en que va molt lligat l'accessibilitat amb l'educació des de petits. Com ho fem, això? Té alguna, té alguna resposta, té alguna solució? Una, Gràcies. Eh? Sí, una, amb una n'hi ha prou. For me, I think that it's quite a serious absence in British life that we've never had either cultural mapping or cultural planning in a major way. I tried to make the point during my talk that all sorts of cultural activities take place in all sorts of spaces, pubs, faith centers, churches, and so on. A lot of that goes, if you like, unmeasured, yeah? But the major thing that we've missed in Britain, I think, is some sort of system of cultural planning for it to take place on the same kind of basis as other forms of recreational planning. It's a remarkable thing in Britain that local government is obliged to provide spaces, physical spaces, open spaces for recreation, but there's virtually no obligation to provide cultural spaces. So there's a tremendous inequity in terms of the opportunity for people to experience cultural activity. And it is, I think, one of the things that I would most want to try and push forward, if you like, because if we're going to a, a challenge or, or, or deal with issues related to inter-social equity, inter-regional um, inter equity, and so on, then I think 
we need something like that. So for every 5,000 people, let's have a certain venue. Yeah? And it's even the case, as I mentioned earlier before, local government isn't even obliged to provide libraries. You know? Uh, and without even libraries, some places in Britain are being left without any kind of venue, space, for cultural expression and activity. And that's potentially a dreadful state of affairs. So if I was to try and give you one answer, <laughs> it would be cultural planning on the basis of the types of recreational planning that take place elsewhere in Britain. I don't know what the state of play is with Catalonia, I don't know. All right? Sí, hola, bon dia. Jo només volia demanar al professor si pogués aprofundir una mica més en la metodologia i en els indicadors qualitatius. Perquè els quantitatius jo crec que ja n'hem parlat tant i hi ha gent que ha arribat a fer fórmules matemàtiques tan interessants com inútils i jo crec que ara ens hem de centrar més en l'avaluació qualitativa. Si pogués ampliar amb aquests minutets que ens queda, gràcies. Hi ha diferents maneres de fer qualitativa, per exemple. Jo suggeriria que... There is an argument in favor for survey-based research with users, consumers, clients uh, of cultural organizations. I do think there's also a space for um, expert panels of critics uh, to provide forms of assessment, qualitative forms of assessment. Now, in terms of particular types of methods, qualitative methods, I would suggest that this can take a number of different forms. Uh, I think participant observation is a really important form of qualitative research, particularly for those people who are going to claim or to be carrying out um, the, uh, the, the critical assessments, the expert panels. I think they should witness, observe the cultural organizations from within. Right? They should be witnessing, they should be part of those cultural activities in order to provide a valid assessment. I'm also of the view that you know, we, we should legitimately recognize the validity of the views of the arts managers themselves. They're going to have a very clear view of whether they think their organizations are successful or not, or whether the particular types of programming they've engaged in needs to be changed and so on. We don't just have to rely on consumers because, you know, I made the point earlier, popularity and value might not be quite the same thing. But we can rely on the managers themselves. And it's been a rather curious um, process, really, when I've been doing research about this over the last 15 years, is that sometimes it's been the managers themselves who've been silent, or they've been rendered silent in the assessment process. Okay? So qualitative methods, I think you can have survey-based methods of consumers, and I can think you can have ethnography and participant observation-based methods for expert critics. Don, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And